Hi everyone, I hope you're doing well. Welcome to the Ikigai International Podcast and today we're having a special guest with us. It's Anastasia Khaweja and uh, I'm so glad to have her as my guest. Hi Anastasia. Hi, thank you for having me. Hello. So um, I'm sure that uh, many know who you are Anastasia, but can you please introduce yourself to whoever is watching us for the first time and don't know who is Anastasia? Uh, so I'm Anastasia Kolaja. I use she, her pronouns, and I currently reside in Ramallah, Palestine. Uh, I've been in the ESL field for, I guess, going on almost two decades at this point. Uh, I've taught around the world, very involved in TESOL International Association. Um, I have a whole bunch of degrees, uh, published some papers, uh, but really I just love being able to connect and uh, meet new friends uh, around the world and especially now in this region where I have found myself since July. So yeah, thank you. Welcome Anastasia and actually what I like about you and your energy, so what I noticed on your social media and is that you are a very enthusiastic person and you like and you love life actually and that's why I, I knew that you were the perfect guest for the Ikigai podcast uh, and uh, let us explain a little bit what is the Ikigai for whoever is listening or hearing this word and listening to the podcast for the first time. So the Ikigai is a Japanese concept. It's a Japanese philosophy and a way of life. It's about finding someone's purpose in life for longevity, for improving life conditions and for enjoying life at its utmost. And I've noticed this, Anastasia, in, in your personality, in be it professional, personal. So um, I'm glad to have you today as my guest. And uh, I'm interested to know, Anastasia, what made you interested first in the uh, teaching profession in, uh, in this field? I was actually thinking about that because when I got my bachelor's degree, uh, I got it in uh, general music and Spanish because I was good at languages, so good at languages. And um, I didn't really know what was going to be next. And I um, started looking at the humanities aspect because I was fascinated by um, aspects of what was happening in music years ago, was happening in uh, poetry, which was also happening in art. Like everything was kind of flowing together. Uh, but the humanities master's program wasn't really, it wasn't really the route I guess I was supposed to take. And I was working as a secretary at a community college. And um, I was just, you know, volunteering at my church and everything. And I somehow found myself volunteering with kids. And I really enjoyed it. And one of my friends, you know, who was also volunteering with me was like, have you ever thought about teaching? And you know how something happens where someone just kind of speaks into your life and you just like you you feel it's coming not just from that person, but from kind of like a higher power. Uh, that was kind of how I felt. I'm like, oh, teaching. And it just kind of started from there. Um, I started looking into ESOL because I spoke Spanish and then that moved me into my very first job at a school. Uh, it was a private school because I didn't have an education degree. And then from there, I wanted to get my professional certification, which meant more classes. Uh, and then I found multilingual, multicultural education through an ESOL elective class, which I found I really had a passion for. And I said that that is what I'm going to do my master's degree in. Then I started my master's degree. Then I started teaching adults, uh, which com which interestingly enough is actually how I met my husband. Um, and, uh, then I found different jobs around the world and, you know, I've kind of been going at it ever since I started my PhD in it because I wanted to do more research. I wanted to really give back. I want people to train teachers to do what I do. Uh, and also just, you know, explore more aspects of not just English, but identity and culture and language and how everything just kind of goes together. Um, so I really looked more at applied linguistics, which is really mainly what I do now. In addition to, of course, teaching, and I've done more like um, English for specific purposes, um, uh, intercultural communication, um, diversity, equity, and inclusion, uh, a lot of different things kind of you know, move into this uh, teaching thing. And all because years ago, it's many years ago, someone told me, have you ever thought about teaching? Uh, so that's kind of, it just kind of went from there, I guess. And uh 
to ask you like um, an even more specific question because what you said is amazing so when it comes to teaching what do you think are the essential characteristics that, that a teacher should have like uh, apart from the academic part do you think that uh, at the level of competence at the level of soft skills at the level so how, how do you see this I mean, the first thing you have to be able to do is be flexible and you have to be open and you have to be someone who knows that they don't have all the answers. Um, the teacher fronted way is not really, and I know a lot of cultures go more teacher fronted and you know I completely respect that. But when it comes to how even how we think, we are not linear hierarchical thinkers. Yet the tenets of how we are taught to teach. Got it. Okay. Yes. So, um, you know, we're not hierarchical, we're not linear thinkers. Um, you know, so when you teach and when you approach a classroom, really at any age, um, you know, there has to be openness and there has to be a, you know, a place where students can feel safe. That has never been more true than, especially during the pandemic, we realized such an important role that teachers have had. Um, and, you know, I think that uh, the connection that we build with our students, um, when you can sense something in the room, it was very hard to try to sense online. So you had to find other ways to connect uh, and to work. And so that flexibility, the innovation, uh, trying to build connections both online and and face to face have, have been really really important. Um, you know, I've had students tell me so many things just because they feel safe, and so um, if they feel safe, I feel like I've done most of my job because in order for them to uh, be able to do the different types of uh, academic tasks that we ask them to do, they have to have their basic needs met, right? Yeah. So. But it's one mm. of the most important things, I think, before you even open a book, you it have is. to be able to have that connection. It is. They, they should master before they bloom. So that's that's what I think. Exactly. And um, exactly. I want to ask you a question because I've seen uh, that your personality is amazing. I'd like to know more about the most creative project that you have worked with your students or a project that your students delivered to you. So both ways. Anyone oh, man. Let me think. Yeah. You know, so my dad was, um, he was a businessman, but he also, first and foremost, he was an artist. Uh, and so anytime in my high school projects, middle school projects, I had a chance to do any kind of artistic thing, I would jump on it and my dad would help me. Right. I remember my, um, Gosh, we did something called, uh, got, um, let's see, was it ninth grade? It was ninth grade world history. We had to do these different projects and it was a project for certain units. So one unit, we literally paper mache at a Roman Coliseum. Um, another unit, it was the Renaissance. And my dad and I, we, we uh, paper mache an egg and it had like art popping out of it because it was a rebirth, right? So I've always loved that creativity and every time I brought these projects and people loved it professors lo uh, teachers um teachers loved it um you know so I've always been able to try to you know bring you know, whatever uh strengths that my students have I just um try to bring that in uh, as far as creativity I've always tried to bring I I've worked in ESL for many years and most of it has been in the United States until I moved here um and so I've always tried to especially during when there's a mainstream class and I have international students in it, like a bridge class where you have domestic students, you have international students, you always want to try to find ways to bring all of the different cultures together. Uh, and so I would always give them choices. Like when, when I did my uh, humanities course, which I loved teaching, uh, I would say you can either uh, expand upon any topic that you want, or you can find something that we've talked about in U.S. humanities and bring your cultural element to it. I have had such amazing projects based on this. I had uh, one of my students look at the Statue of Liberty uh, uh, construction, which we talked about, and she's Brazilian. So she talked about uh, Christ the Redeemer statue and like that that uh, whole thing. Um, I had students, I one of my uh, German students talk about um, 
the Harlem Renaissance and how, you know, African Americans had, you know, really it was important for them to show this artistic and, you know, side of them uh, that, you know, white people wouldn't essentially fear. And she said that was how Germans felt after World War II to, to remember that we're not all Nazis. And these all came from them. These connections were just amazing. And, you know, domestic, and, you know, my domestic students learned and everything, but it was just a way for everyone to kind of be able to share. Um, anytime that students can bring their own cultural connections and kind of build new spaces is just a really exciting time. Um, I remember when I taught a poetry class and I told them to find to, to make found poems, which would be just, you know, finding words for magazines and creating and, you know, constructing. Uh, and one of my students, I think he was from he wasn't from Palestine. He was from uh, another Arab country. He wrote a poem about Palestine and just made me cry. I forget exactly what the content was, but it was just so powerful and so moving. Anytime students can find ways to bring themselves or to bring in another aspect of creativity is a way that they can build connection because uh, they're doing it in English too, you know, building connection to the language, but also infusing their culture uh, within the language as well. And again, like creating a new space that maybe had not been open previously. Um, but yeah, I think that may answer your question. <laughs> I kind of went is. a little bit on the... It is, it is. Uh, Actually, it answers... Uh fully and even more than I was expecting and maybe like um, uh, I was I was about to ask you another question which is the cultural aspect but you've answered this all in one and uh, I believe that we can't teach English outside of the context because we, we're teaching human beings after all and uh, we can help them even embrace that difference and uh, talk about it in a safe environment and um, you know when it comes to building their personalities for example when it comes to young learners Uh, teenage learners and adult learners it's good that they feel safe so that they can speak up and they can express themselves and learn the language meanwhile because it's the language is not dissociated from the context and um, perfect that was amazing Anastasia and uh, as for your passion for teaching let's say uh, let us now dive deeper into it so when did you know at that particular moment that you wanted to pursue further research in, um, in, in, in English studies and you said, no, it, it's not enough just to be a teacher, I'm just going to uh, fulfill more research so that I can share my experience and uh, establish kind of um, um, further search, further, let's say, um, Uh, I, how can I explain this? So uh, maybe it's beyond just the certificate, beyond just the degree. So you knew that's your purpose of life. So that's something like when you wake up in the morning, this is what I want to do. Yeah, you know, I mean, I for a long time now, sometimes like, you know, I'll wake up and be like, I get to go teach. I get to do research i get to help students develop their th like this is my i could do this as a job i get paid to do this uh that's just a very exciting thing and um i was able to revitalize that when i was able to you know move in move out of the country but we can talk about that um uh we can revisit that in a little bit but um One of the ways I knew I absolutely wanted to not just be a teacher but also to train and to help was Uh, when I was actually in the ESOL class, which I referred to, uh, to get my professional certification to teach, because I wanted to try to teach outside the private school, I was like, let me see what I can do. Um, I had a really challenging first year as a teacher. They hired me as a Spanish teacher, but they, but that was only part time, but they really wanted me full time. So they said, you know what, you can go teach second grade. I'm like, I don't have an education degree. I don't know how to teach kids. You know, it's like, it's okay. Here's the curriculum. You'll do fine or whatever. And, you know, my mentor teacher, her son was in my class. And on top of that, she, that was her class. She was the second grade teacher, but because the school did not want her to teach her own son, they moved her to first grade. So not only was she upset that she had to move from the second grade class and she could not teach her son. Here is this very novice first year, barely out of college uh, girl essentially coming in to teach the class. Um, 
Now, while there were some, you know, somewhat trying times, I ended up earning her respect by the end. I worked so hard and we ended up actually developing a really nice relationship, which I was very, very grateful for. Uh, and she was grateful that I stepped up to the challenge and I worked with her son and everything. Um, but I, um, so when I was sitting, so I had, though, I had somebody who actually tested borderline autism. I had another student whose English was not so great, but of course I didn't know enough to identify him as an ESOL student. Uh, you know, there were a lot of students who really needed help. It was a private school. It didn't have the resources. It was me, um, you know, and I had to try to make things work with several different types of students. When I was in this ESOL class, which of course they said, you should take the ESOL class because you know Spanish and we need ESOL teachers. I'm like, well, what is ESOL? I had no idea what ESOL was. Uh, English um, is basically teaching English speakers of other languages. And I'm sitting in this class and he, this uh, professor was teaching us about how to adapt materials for ESOL students. And we were sitting and we were looking at this word problem for math. It was like a fifth or sixth grade level. And he just matter of factly says, how can you make this word problem workable for students who may not understand English? And there were people, you know, they were undergraduates. I was the only one of the few that had a degree and was already actively teaching. And they were sitting here like, well, it's a word problem. I mean, they have to be able to do a word problem. I mean, how else can you, like, they couldn't understand, they couldn't get it. And so I'm sitting and I'm listening to them. And then all of a sudden, and I just start, I'm like, but they don't, they can't do it. This is his point. So if they can't do it, this is your job. How do you do your job to make sure that your students can learn? I looked at me and the professor looked at me and was like, so we're going to take a break now. <laughs> and we're going to come back to this. And that was the point where I said, hey, is there a master's degree in this? Because I want to do this. Because I realized that teachers don't know how to teach everybody. There was a growing number of ESOL students uh, in the state of Florida at the time, and it was continuing and continuing. So how could I be that teacher to be in the classrooms, but also how could I also help to train the teachers in order to do this? And that was like right there. And they said, oh, well, actually, yes, there is a program. And that was when I knew. And I started the process. I think I was in the class in May. I started the program in uh, that fall. I started the program in August. I started the, the um, master's program. Well, I still concurrently taught um, at my school. And um, yeah, and then during the course of my PhD, I looked at, um, or, or I'm sorry, during the course of my master's uh, degree program, um, I took another class, which was a linguistics uh, research class. I fell in love with it. I fell in love with the different ways in which we can teach a language, not just English, but other languages. And I was fascinated by multilingualism and how languages can be stored or absorbed in the brain and, you know, how it can come out input, output. I was fascinated by all of it. Uh, and I wanted to do more. And I'm like, well, well, how can I learn more about this? Oh, you do a PhD. Oh, okay. So, you know, then at that point, you know, I knew I wanted to do a PhD at some point. Um, after I traveled a little bit, I taught a little bit. Um, I was in Dubai for a while. Uh, but then I knew I wanted to do more research. I wanted to look more into this because even when you look at psycho um, uh, um, psycholinguistics, sociolinguistics, there are always different ways. There are always different um, innovations uh, these days. And so I wanted to be part of that. And so that is how um, that's how I just knew uh, as I started to, you know, teach more, go to more countries. I knew I wanted more. I knew I wanted more. Um, I still want more, but I'm done with school. I'm done. Um, I'm done being a student, um, but I want to contribute more and I want to also learn more from different people. So I think we're always, I think as an educator, I think as a true educator, we always know that we're lifelong learners and the more that we learn, the more we want to get back. Sure. Yeah. I agree with you like 100%. It's like, um, first, let me talk about the first part is that sometimes like we can get a degree, they teach us what is academic, but sometimes it's not obvious that you apply this to teach a methodology. So, and there, there are degrees and there are certificates for that so that we can apply and we can blend the two so that we can make sure our learners get the best learning experience ever. And um, as for multilingualism, I absolutely agree with you. And in, uh, in most of the cases, in most of my workshops, I always start 
by talking about how, how I learned another language apart from English. And uh, it's amazing how you see this from a different perspective. And, uh, and being a lifelong learner, I guess, is part of growth mindset. And uh, the more we learn, the less we know. That's what I think is like, I discover a lot of times that I see. Look, this is new and, um, and it, I'm, never, I'm never afraid of being, um, I'm, I've never been afraid of being exposed to new content because I think that we're not unteachable. So we should dare even to be, uh, to unlearn things. So, oh, yeah. uh, so in order to learn them the right way or a new way, because things are evolving. For example, what is happening nowadays with AI? Everyone, they've been scared of AI and, uh, and they said maybe it will replace teachers in the classroom or be losing, teachers will be losing their profession. But no, it's like kind of, we all are assisted through AI. So a good teacher knows how to employ, employ that to empower his students, exactly. his or her students. So imply them and let's say, um, and use that for the most kind of the most beneficial outcome for the lesson and for the class and because this will be the future so we shouldn't be afraid of that now yeah, and uh, plus, yeah, aren't human. you cannot beat a human connection um you know they might try to supplement you know but there's no i i've not ever really been afraid that robots will completely replace teachers because mm -hmm. I mean, they can be assistants and, you know, maybe, maybe there might be less teacher assistant jobs because they're going to try to bring in robots. But as far as like that core person to make sure that the classroom is running the way it needs to, a robot can't do that. Yeah. And, and uh, even when it comes to AI and augmented reality, so both of them, they, they need human intervention. They need, need humans to complete, for example, the, the chat box. It's like there's a human being type in right. the sentence or whatever, so that AI will process this. It's not like 100%, so we control that. But it's like, just right. like in movies, it's like, it's the impression as if AI is going to take over the world. But I guess uh, not, for, not for the moment. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't... Yeah, but now your next question for you, Anastasia, is apart from teaching, apart from teaching, yeah. where do you see yourself like, uh, when it comes to your identity as a person and uh, maybe um, your hobbies, any anything that makes you feel well at ease, makes you feel happy, makes you feel like um, comfortable doing what you want in life? I mean, I love to travel. Um, I love traveling in different countries and, you know, I love um, being able to have the opportunity to present and teach in other countries, but really like I love to be able to uh, just enjoy um, other cultures, be exposed to other languages. Um, I really, I love yoga um, and I love Pilates. Uh, I used to run. I was a runner in the States actually, and I ran a couple of marathons and um, at the time I really needed it, running was like a release for me. Um, but, you know, here, uh, it's, I really can't run here. Um, I don't feel as safe to run here because I'm afraid that if I'm running, people might think I'm running from something or, you know, I just, I, I don't trust that I am safe enough to be able to run on my own without maybe a not just not feeling as secure. Uh, so, you know, I found that running had a purpose for me in the States and it didn't serve the same purpose here. Uh, so, you know, I'm very happy with my Pilates and my yoga and, you know, some weightlifting here and there. Um, you know, so it's not, it was much, but, you know, I love to, um, get together with friends. Um, I love to be able to really kind of relax. I think that in the States, I worked a lot and during the pandemic, uh, I didn't really have office hours um, because I wasn't in an official, like an, in a physical, you know, like office. Um, so when you talk, we teach international students, they're literally all over the world. Sometimes they're meeting you or they're trying to say, hey, are you available? It's like midnight. Oh, yeah. Well, since I don't have to go to work and I just have to roll out of bed and teach, you know, there was really no boundary. Right. So um, it took some time to reestablish those boundaries, but then also moving on the other side of the world where um, you're forced to slow down in a lot of ways um, because it's not as fast paced uh, as the States. Um, I think it made me be able to just kind of appreciate things more, be more involved with what my kids are doing in school. 
um you know the teachers are not as you know they're good here but they're not as like thorough here um the educational opportunities are not as much as they are in the states and so sometimes that has to be supplemented by me um and um also just being able to find you know things for my kids to do it takes hunting like it takes time to be able to try to do that um in the states it was always like oh yeah you've got this club you got that club you have that recreational thing it was really easy to find things you know like here like my my oldest son is is a swimmer not a lot of swimming opportunities here and so we've had to try to find like the recreation center there's actually a ymca here uh so being able to you know just like have that um you know get the kids to have my youngest son's going to play right now um getting the kids to have their connections in addition to um you know like just being able to try to find a sense of belonging i think um has made me feel really happy and it has nothing to do with my teaching or my you know writing or anything like that um i'm also finding more time to write um you know i was trying to write this paper that i had started years ago when i was in grad school in my women and gender studies classes and it has something to do with my autoethnography and my experience in palestine i can finally start writing about that because i live here um so different things that i can kind of really think deeply about what certain cultural aspects mean to me how i feel about that things i'm going to adapt things i'm not going to adopt things i'm going to kind of literally infuse into my life and things i won't um there's a lot about the culture that i do uh infuse into my life like even language wise there are certain words i don't even say in english anymore uh it's just in arabic now um, that was my question actually yeah <laughs> yeah it's like there's yeah I don't even say them in English anymore. It yeah. doesn't seem it doesn't seem as fulfilling to just say <laughs> the English. And there are certain things that are not even translated or not even translatable from English to Arabic and you know things like that. So yeah, just you know different things that you know just you know just again it's not very specific, but I don't really have a lot of specific things living here. You know, things pop up, you deal. There are strikes, you deal. Um, you know, there's, you know, travel challenges you deal and, you know, you just, you know, yeah. Yeah. Thanks for sharing, Anastasia. Actually, that was my my last question before we wrap up is oh. like, yeah, the um, you've mentioned Arabic, so I was about to ask you a question, but uh, please feel free if you don't want to answer the question, just say no. And uh, I was about to ask you about any nice words you you learn in the Arabic language, so something oh, yeah. that you use it maybe, or oh. a, a, a word that you said this is a nice word and and uh, mm -hmm. I, I can use it on a daily basis or whatever. So uh. yeah, no, that's a really good question. You know, there's a lot of things that do not translate directly, and I've stopped trying to find direct translations because certain things just you know cannot be translated. Even like I think English too, but most things in certain languages grasp concepts and emotions and feelings much better. Um, there's one that, you know, and anybody who is listening, if you know the act actual English translation, let me know because anyone who I talk to, they don't have an exact translation. But there's one thing that we say all the time uh, when we see somebody after they've worked at, in their house or after they've, you know, taught a class or kitchen, we always say, and then the response is, right? Um, a lot of things in Arabic is kind of like call and response. I mean, like I, I have a humanities background. I love jazz music. So I appreciate the whole call and response. Salam alaikum, alaikum salam, salam, take Allah salamik or Allah salamik if you're, you know, male or female. Nice. Arabic, is, <laughs> Arabic is very gendered. Uh, so mm. I've kind of learned, you know, things like that. Like, you know, even for me, like I don't say things like feel better. I always say salam because I feel like it's like, it's wishing salam is peace. In Arabic, right? So you're always wishing peace and health and well-being on the person. And Arabic seems to get that across much better than English ever has. Uh, so that's just part of my, you know, vocabulary uh, now. Um, also, you know, I bond a lot with my mother-in-law by cooking. So well, I was learning, she was teaching me dishes to cook for her son because, you know, I'm pescatarian. I don't eat a lot of meat. So I had to learn, like, how to cook. Um, so a lot of the spices and vegetables and fruits i know in arabic mostly um i don't even use the english words anymore um even when we move back to the states from dubai we use a lot of the arabic words and so of course now living here we all use the arabic words for most everything in the kitchen um because that is you know just it's we use it a lot more often so 
yeah that's um, perfect you know yatik al afia in our dialect in the tunisian dialect we say yatik al which means which means which means health yatik al afia it's the same yeah, yeah. 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 and uh, yeah. there is a salam that when you're eating when you're eating too say saha or sahteen to help yeah and <laughs> you like, see me comment true, right? literally two healths yeah. and it's yeah. like you're always you're you're constantly wishing somebody well uh and then you say something back you know it's like this constant you know thing it's like yeah actually and and um, once i noticed this and i wanted to um kind of um once i saw you posting something about food is and i wanted to say like saha sahteen because like uh, it seems to be very yummy and uh, and i knew that you were speaking arabic so um and uh, thanks for being uh, for keeping this flexible mindset and for learning from everyone equally and i learned from you actually your energy whatever you share online is very inspirational to everyone and uh, look whoever visits your profile okay comes across your posts like uh, cannot but be inspired by you anastasia and uh, now we're, 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 we haven't still worked a lot together like we're now working together in Tefal Kuwait and we're, we're, we're volunteering both of us for this and uh, I guess we'll be, we'll be having plenty of things to, to, to share and to learn from each other and um, thank you very much for, for being my guest today. Would you like to add anything before we wrap up? Yeah, no, I just want to say thank you for the work that you do. I think we met through one of our, I guess one of the many presentations Avery in all my it was IELTA or something it was one of the IELTA presentations um but you're always constantly active you always um have different opportunities for different people so um it's a lot of work I always see that you're so active so thank you for the work that you do and the connections that you bring and I hope we can meet in person I uh, wish I'm inviting you to Tunisia to my country (laughs) yes we're in the same region now so now we have to Anyway, yeah. So thank you for everything you do, and thank you for bringing us together so we can have this beautiful connection for this time. Thank you, thank you, Anastasia, and uh, thank you for sharing your ikigai, which means like your purpose in life. Ikigai is a word, and uh, it's beyond the word. So what we're discussing in the podcast, we're not just sticking to a word which can be defined through a dictionary or word through a book. So it's like a kind of a way of life, a lifestyle that most of us we embrace. Uh, as people and as professionals and I was interested most of all in knowing my colleagues Ikigai because we share the same profession but not necessarily the same interest but we guess what attracts both of us your vibe attracts the tribe so that is what makes us come along together together is that we share uh, certain things that makes us keep this uh, growth mindset all of us and uh, I hope to see you soon in person and more of a like more of a virtual events and, and, and more, more specifically inshallah so let's see if we're going to meet in a uh, face-to-face um, Anastasia thank you very much for your time and for sharing uh, I know that the podcast is a little bit short because uh, I, I just want to make this very fun and easy to use so that people can listen to it on the go. But I'm sure we'll be having other podcasts in the future. Thank you very much, Anastasia. Thanks.